So the first question to start it off, just checking that you can differentiate properly. So here you've got a product, product of two different types of functions, and the second one is a function of a function. You can always emphasize that by putting that in brackets. So for three marks, it just says differentiate it. <coughs> so it's a product. e to the x just goes to e to the x. And leave that one alone. And then leave that one alone. Well, you wouldn't have noticed the difference. And then sine, sine goes to cos. So that's times cos of whatever it was operating on multiplied by the derivative of the inner function, which would be times 2x. And then it's just a case of how could we tidy that up? Well, you can take out e to the x as a factor, and that would leave you with sine x squared plus 2x cos x squared for the first one. For the second one, a quotient, although you could if you wanted, take that up, put a negative one, and do it as a product rule again. I'll do it as a quotient. So, square the bottom. Then it's proceed much as a product rule. So it's differentiate the one on top, 3x squared, leaving the one below alone, 1 plus tan x, not the x squared version, just the original version, minus leave the first one alone, and now differentiate the other one. So tan x is, one's going to go to zero because it's a constant, and tan x goes to sec squared x. Then it's just a case of, can you tidy that up at all? Oh, you could take out x squared, if that's any better. So you've got x squared times, three times one plus tan x minus x sec squared x. All over. 1 plus tan x squared. And that would be 5 marks worth altogether. Thank you very much. Number 2. The second and third terms of a geometric series, u2 are negative 6, and u3, 3. Why has it got something to infinity and obtain the sum for 5 marks? <coughs> well, that's very easy. Well, Geometric series should look like this. Un should be the first term, a, times the common multiplying ratio to the power n minus 1. You start with a term a, and then you keep adding, you keep multiplying by r to generate the successive terms. Well, so that means I can replace that. U2 would have to be a times r to the power 1, so it's just a times r is negative 6, and u3 means a times r squared is 3. So you've got a pair of simultaneous equations. Dividing them, I'll give them names, 1 and 2, I should have left more room there. So if you do 2 divided by 1, 2 divided by 1 would cancel out the a's and leave you with r squared over r, which would be r, and that would be 3 over negative 6, which means that r is negative a half. That's the first bit. To find a, you could put it back into this one. If r is negative a half, that means a times negative a half is negative 6. So a would be negative 6 multiplied by negative 2. So a would be 12. So the actual question, explain why the series has a sum to infinity and get that sum. Well, the multiplying ratio is a proper fraction, so the terms will converge. So you simply need to say that since negative a half is a proper fraction, just show that by the absolute value of it being less than 1. So the terms will converge and have a sum to infinity. Find that sum? Well, the sum to infinity is a over 1 minus r. So that would be 12 over 1 minus negative a half. That's the same as 12 over 1 and a half, which is 3 upon 2, doubling all 24 upon 3, which equals 8. So that means the sum to infinity equals 8. 5 marks. Right, carry out this integration, but it tells you the substitution to use. You probably could have guessed it anyway. There's no point in using 1 plus x to the 8, because that's not the derivative of it. That's be quite an awkward one. That would be x squared to the power 4 and 1 plus something squared with an inverse tan. So you probably could have guessed, let something equal x to the 4, so you'd have that thing squared, plus 
x cubed is the derivative of x to the 4. So, I told us anyway, but you could have got it yourself. Let t equal x to the 4, and then proceed towards the answer. So if t is x to the 4, dt by dx would be 4 times x cubed. So in order to change these differentials into the order for that substitution, dx would be dt over 4x cubed, and then put it in there. So that's going to be x cubed. That can't stay. It's going to have to go. If it doesn't go completely, I'd have to use this rearrangement. Over 1 plus, well, x to the 4 is t. So that's x to the 4 squared. So that's t squared. Instead of dx, I'm going to make it dt over 4x cubed. And there you go. The x cubed's cancel. The 4 can come out. So I've got a quarter of, it's just dt over 1 plus t squared. So that's just going to be one quarter of, and that's the simple pattern for inverse tan of t, plus some number. Put it back the way it was. t was x to the 4, so it's one quarter of inverse tan of x to the 4 plus c. And that's part a. Right, 3 part b, integrate x squared ln x with respect to x. And there it is. Well, there you go. Integration by parts. You spot it straight away. It's the equivalent of the product rule for differentiation. Well, it derives from that in the first place. Tempted to say, oh, I'll differentiate this because it'll whittle itself down to nothing. But no, because that means integrating that. That'd be a bit nasty. So I'll have to be integrate that and differentiate that. That's the plan. Right, so if we go, integrate that. Up to 3 divided by 3, leave that alone. Minus the integral of, leave that one alone. I could have put that third outside. And then differentiate that. There you go, very nice. So you've got one third of x cubed ln x. That'll cancel down to x squared. So I've got one third. I could have just written this answer down straight away. I don't know why I'm doing this. One third of x squared dx, because this means I've got to write this all over again. Ln x, oh, blah, blah, up to three, divide by three, minus one ninth of x cubed. And then plus c, having finally carried out the last integration. So I need the constant. Well, that would be the answer to it. I always prefer to make it neater. Take out common factors. The worst fraction I've got is 9, so I'll take out a ninth. x cubed in both terms, that would leave me, if I'm taking out a factor of a ninth, everything inside will have to be 9 times bigger than it was, so I'll make that a 3 ln x minus 1, and I'll just leave that c separate. So, 3 part b. Question 4. Obtain the 2 by 2 matrix associated with an enlargement, scale factor 2, I'll call that one M1, and a clockwise rotation of 60, call it M2, says clockwise. Angles are defined in the anti-clockwise direction, so this would be a rotation of negative 60 then. And then the matrix you want would be M2, M1, in other words, M1 followed by M2. If you remember them, put them down, multiply them out, there you are. If you don't remember them, then just remember how to get them. To get M1, for instance, if you multiply it by the identity matrix, whatever the result is, will be M1. Consider the identity matrix as two points to be transformed, the point 1, 0 and the point 0, 1. And then simply say, what happens to them? Enlargement scale factor 2, dilatation, centre the origin, scale factor 2. That would go to 2. 1, 0 would go to 2, 0. 0, 1 would go to 0, 2 which means M1 is the matrix 2, 0, 0, 2. The next one, which may well have been the only one you took time out to learn. M2, the one associated with the rotation, because you can rem maybe remember that as cos, sine, negative sine, cos. If you just remember that in polar coordinates, if you like, for an angle theta, for any given length there, this side is the cosine, so that side will be r cos theta, and that side being the sine will be r sine theta. So whatever length they are, that's going to be the cosine of it. That's going to be the, the sine of it. Still, just doing it from first principles here. So times 1, 0, 0, 1 is going to be what? Well, a rotation of negative 60. So this point's going to rotate through to here. This is of length 1, so it'll just be that part will be the cosine, that part will be the sine of the 60 of the negative 60 rather, but I've got it in a diagram. So that part's the cosine, so that'll be cos 60, and that part's the sine, that's negative, because it's going downwards, negative sine 60. 
Or you could just think the sine of negative 60 is the negative of sine of 60. This one, as it rotates through 60 backwards, well it's the same thing. That part's going to be the sine, so of sine of 60, and the y coordinate, which is still positive, will be the cosine, cos 60. Put them back up here. So that I've got, then for these two parts, I've got the cos of 60. Now the cos of 60 is a half. Maybe I'll just, they're all halves, so I'll just take that half out. So that will just be 1. The sine of 60 is root 3 up in 2, so I'll just put the root 3 in, put the half out already. Negative of it, negative root 3, and then cos of 60 is a half again, I've got the half out, so just 1. Then all I have to do is multiply those together. In fact, what I'll do is I'll just take that half and knock them down to 1s. And with them going down to 1s, that just means I'm multiplying by the identity matrix. So I'm just going to end up with 1, negative root 3, root 3, 1. And that's the answer. There we go. Question 5. Show that you've got this relationship between these combinations. Those being the coefficients that you use in the binomial expansion, although you're not considering a binomial expansion here. Well, so it's a standard. Take the left-hand side. Take the left-hand side <coughs> and show it produces the right-hand side. It all depends which formula we put down. Well, I'll put the full formula for it down. So this, this says, how many ways are there of choosing three objects from n plus one objects? Well, the formula is, you've got n plus one factorial divided by n plus one minus three factorial, because I'm not interested in the remainder of them. It's only the first three I want. How many ways are of choosing the first one? How many ways are of choosing the second one? How many ways are of choosing the third one? And then out of those ways, you've got different orders. I don't care which one comes first, second or third. So divide that out by three factorial, the number of ways of arranging the same three objects. Now you could either do that, or you could shorten that to the way you would normally do it if you were working out a coefficient. Because if that's knocking out the remainder of them after the first three, then it would just be n plus 1 times n times n minus 1 over, I'll put it out, 3 times 2 times 1. It always balance. That number of ways of choosing the first one, that number of ways of choosing the second one, now that's been chosen, that number of ways of choosing the third one, now they've been chosen, but that includes all the different combinations of the same one appearing in first, second and third place, so divided by all the different arrangements of the same three. But I'll just stick with this. So I've got that, take away, same for this, n factorial over n minus 3 factorial, 3 factorial, right, single fraction, because that's just one term. What have they got? I need the greatest common denominator. They've both got uh, 3 factorial, that one's higher, so I'm going to put in n plus 1 minus 3 factorial. So the top can stay in this one, because I didn't change its denominator, but this one, this n factorial, is going to, it's got the 3 factorial, it's got n minus 3, it needs one more, it needs this extra term, n plus 1 minus 3. And I'll just tidy that lot up. Because n plus 1 minus 3 is just n minus 2 times n factorial over 3 factorial times n minus 2 factorial. Right, take a common factor at the top. So the best I can do is n factorial, because n plus 1 factorial means n plus 1 times n times n minus 1. In other words, this part here is n factorial. So I can take out n factorial, just leaving the n plus 1, minus, and that had that factor n minus 2, all over 3 factorial n minus 2 factorial. Ooh, I'm running out of room here. Now that can n take away n, cancels out. 1 plus 2 is 3, so I've got a 3 that can cancel out part of that. I might have to do that because I haven't got room for another line. So that 2 over the 3 factorial, sorry, that 3, 1 plus 2 is 3. The 3 over the 3 factorial will cancel out the 3 from that because 3 factorial is 3 times 2 times 1 and just leave the 2 times 1. 2 factorial, which equals that, which equals n2, which equals right hand side. So that's it done. Question 6. Given these three vectors, written as multiples of the unit base vectors, so I'm just putting them back as column vectors, calculate this. 
which you may or may not recognise as the scalar triple, triple product. If you don't, you can just work out in two parts. Do that cross product, and then whatever vector results from that, do the scalar product of that with that to get a single number as an answer. Because that's what the result of this will be. A vector dot a vector is going to be the scalar product, just a single number. But it is the scalar triple product, and it's got a geometrical significance. Not that you need it for this question, which would be this. That will give you the volume of a deformed cuboid, a parallelopipid, in space, made up with sides pointing in the directions of these three vectors. So if I had a vector u, v, a vector w, and a vector, let's just say u is going off at this angle here, those could define the three sides well, of why on earth are you a parallelopipid, where all the sides are parallelograms, sides you mean all edges. parallel. And then u cross v, sorry, v cross w would produce a vector at right angles to the plane here, at right angles to the base, so a vector up this way. And the volume of that is given by the area of the base times the perpendicular height. Well, that perpendicular, the perpendicular height would be not the vector u, but the component of u that goes in the same direction. In other words, u dot whatever the cross product is. Anyway, you can do it in two bits, or well, there's a single step you could do for that, if you remember it, which is to put this one across the top, negative 2, 0, 5, the vector here, 3, 2, negative 1, negative 1, 4, and take the determinant of that 3 by 3 matrix. So you've got this, and it's quite handy, because there's a zero row there, or a zero entry rather, so you've got negative 2 times its minor, 2, negative 1, 1, 4, 0, forget it, it would have been negative, but forget it, plus 5 times its minor, the sign being positive, 3, 2, negative 1, 1. So that means the answer is just going to be negative 2 times, and I'll just put it in one go, and 5 times 8, take away negative 1, is 9, 3, take away negative 2, is 5, so the scalar product to this is going to come to negative 18, plus 25, which is going to give me 7. And the geometrical significance of that is that parallelopipid would have a volume of 7 units cubed. But you didn't need to do that, you could just do this. Alternatively, you might just have done that without realising that it was the scalar triple product and just think, right, well I've got this vector, negative 2, 0, 5, I'm going to take the scalar product of that with this with 3, 2, negative 1, cross negative 1, 1, 4. So that would be negative 2, 0, 5, dot, whatever this produces, and you could do that the quick way, which would be, for the first component, it's going to be 8, take away negative 1, which is 9. For the next component, which is negative, do it in reverse, 1, <coughs> 1, take away 12, negative 11. Not that it matters, it's going to multiply by 0. And for the last component, it's going to be positive again. 3, take away um, negative 2, 5. Multiplying it out, negative 2 times 9, negative 18, plus 0, plus 25, and you still get the answer, 7. There you go.